Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we appreciate everyone attending. Um, we plan on this to be the start of what we hope is gonna be a consistent series that the Sephardic Community Alliance will hold for young professionals. Uh, before we begin, I want to just take a moment to introduce you to where we are right now. The Center for Jewish History is a cultural institution, independent research facility, and destination for the exploration of Jewish history and heritage. The archival collections here spend more than 700 years of history and total over 500,000 volumes and 100 million documents. Uh, we hope you had the chance to visit the galleries inside the museum before tonight's talk, and I'd like to personally thank Lauren Karp from the Center for her assistance in helping put this night together. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the president of the SCA. It's been an honor and a privilege working under Jaime Shama. He is a special individual with a true love for the Sephardic community and the Jewish community at large. To give you some background on the SCA and the amazing work they do, Mr. Jaime Shama. Thank you, Mari. Working with you has been a, a pleasure and an honor. Your energy, your enthusiasm, the night would not have happened without your help. About six years ago, a group of men got together, a group of lay leaders got together and determined that it was a time for action. It was a time to unify our community and establish a declaration of values that would bind us, bring us together, and maintain our traditional Sephardic values. It was a monumental task to bring together these institutions. Mr. Morris Bailey chaired that first meeting. Through his vision and through his insights, the SCA formed. He gave Mr. Eli Harari the title of president to drive a massive effort within the community. Roll forward five years later, these two fine gentlemen called me and said, hey, Jaime, we need you. We would like you to chair this organization. I was extremely flattered, I'm still flattered, and I'm doing my best to try and drive forward. One thing I learned from them is that the SCA is driven by youth. It's driven by education. It's driven by leadership. The fine young men and women in this room are the future of our community, a community that's faced with enormous challenge. We hope that the SCA will be able to help. About our programming, during the summers in New Jersey, we have prayers and a lecture series that goes on at the JCC. We have learning that goes on nightly for young men and women, and we have uh, a full house during the day, women during the day, men and women during the night. One of our most successful programs is the iLead program. The iLead program is remarkable. Any iLeaders in the room? Yes? Bravo. Bravo for your leadership. <laughs> iLead is a, a five-week program that takes place in Israel with intensive leadership training. We've seen the benefit. We've seen the product. We're now going into our fifth year under the leadership of Richie Shalme, and it's only going up from here. Our, our organization consists of 27 individual organizations. We act as an umbrella group. We try to act cohesively. As Rabbi Sachs spoke to us earlier tonight, we are uni unified, but we are not uniform. We work together for the benefit of the community. Those I leaders I talked about, we've instituted this year a program where everyone can experience I leadership by joining the SCA birthright trips. We've partnered with the OU, and this is a free birthright trip, but a birthright trip designed to help instill those same leadership values. Actually, the, uh, the madrichim for the, the birthright program are themselves I leaders. 
We feel these young people are the ones that will go forward to college campuses and move along through this very challenging time, empowered in understanding their Jewish identity and Israel. We've also launched a periodical. Maybe some of you have read it and seen it around our, our uh, synagogues, Kol HaKahal. This is uh, managed by Mr. Mari Mizrahi, who's done an outstanding job to bring rabbinic leadership and talented educators, informed individuals to write together and put out a quality publication like this week after week. We've also introduced some great speakers. Tonight is, is, is exceptional. A couple of weeks ago, we had MK Danny Danon in, uh, in Mikdash Eliyahu, and he spoke to us uh, actually about Purim and uh, some of the challenges facing the Israeli government today. That's programming that informs us and educates us. We have a new program that's launching this Thursday night, uh, two weeks Thursday night, two weeks from tonight, at the Mag and David of Manhattan, which is designed for and designed by college-aged individuals. The first, e the first event will be a premiere of Crossing the Line. Crossing the Line is all about what's happening on college campuses today. It addresses the BDS issue. It addresses a lot of the issues that our young people face on campus. It's produced by an organization called Jerusalem U. We work closely with them and we've premiered several of their movies and will continue to do so. This is the type of material that we make available to schools and we encourage them to take advantage of. Tonight we have uh, two moderators who will sit and um, help us take complete advantage of what we have tonight. Joseph Sasson, he's a BA from Brandeis. He's uh, quite a remarkable person. I've had the privilege to sit with him uh, several mornings and understand the depth of his knowledge. We welcome you and thank you. Please join us on stage. <laughs> and we have Ms. Adele Shabbat. Uh, her, she herself has uh, participated in many of our SCA programs. Uh, she's an author of a, of a book and she's an inspiring young leader. And the future's looking really bright with these individuals. Please join us. Without further ado, a man who does not need introduction, but I'll try. We welcome Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, past chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, a gentleman who is author of over two dozen books, multiple periodicals. Many of us read his weekly Shabbat newsletter uh, remarks and enjoy it greatly. A man who has placed an imprint on Jewish society that will indelibly last into the future, and a man whose wisdom we very, very badly need. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Rabbi Jonathan Sachs to our podium. Uh, Joseph, Adele, friends, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful welcome. And thank you for being you, because the Syrian Jewish community is so very special and one of the great treasures of the Jewish world. It's amazing how powerfully you keep your tunes, your food, and your wonderful traditions. But above all, most importantly, you have this wonderful, warm welcome to Elena, myself, but to all of you. It is a really welcoming community. The first community of which I was the rabbi was not terribly welcoming. It could actually freeze a stranger out at 200 yards. 
And I wanted to tell them politely, but firmly, this is not the Jewish way. So I said to them, you know what? This is a wonderful shoe. But I want you to imagine that one day, after all our waiting, the Mashiach comes. And the first place he comes is to our shoe. I said, just imagine the scene. He arrives on Shabbos morning, and the fellow at the door says, who are you? And he says, I'm the Mashiach. And the guy at the door says, tell me, are you a member here? <laughs> I think uh, you don't have to be a Mashiach to have a wonderful, warm welcome from the Syrian Jewish community, and I thank you for it. And I just remind you of this great truth, because somebody who heard we were coming to New York, somebody up there forgot to switch the heating on. So um, I have to tell you, it never gets this cold in England. In England, we do many things. We do damp, wet, soggy, miserable, cloudy, and all the rest. But cold like yours, we don't do. So I want to say that in New York, the only thing that gets warmer the wider you open your doors is a Jewish community. So I thank you for your warmth, and I bless you, and may all you do be blessed. Thank you so much. Friends, uh, I was asked I, I had to talk about something, but I've forgotten what I was talk to, asked to talk about. I think it was, you know, why, why are we Jewish? What does it say to us in this wonderful, technologically moving and very turbulent 21st century? Well, I'll tell you how I learned the answer to this. When I became chief rabbi in 1991, for five years, I ran around all the shoes all the shoes in Britain, all the shoes in the Commonwealth. I went to every single one of them several times. After five years, I said to Elaine, I think I've met every Jew who comes to shoe. I now have a problem. How do I meet the Jews who never come to shoe? So I decided to do something a little bit different. I decided to do quite a lot of broadcasting on the radio, television for the BBC. I wrote for the national press. Uh, it was a very interesting experiment because in Britain, obviously, I was addressing an audience, 99.5% of which is not Jewish and mostly not religious. But it was quite useful because I would broadcast, for instance, on the BBC main news program in the morning, and a Jew who would never go to shul would come into his office in the morning, and his non-Jewish colleague in the next office would say to him, I heard your chief rabbi on the radio this morning. Well, he wasn't bad. I turned the whole of Britain into an outreach organization for the <laughs> Jewish community. Now, this had, as everything interesting uh, always has, unintended consequences. Because the end result of this was that I got to know and be known by non-Jews at least as well as I was by Jews. In fact, we had a wonderful moment two years ago when we were lighting Hanukkah candles in 10 Downing Street in the home of the Prime Minister. And Michael Gove, who was the Secretary of State for Education, got up and said, you know what? I agree with the Chief Rabbi on everything he says. And if that doesn't prove I'm a Gentile, I don't know what does. <laughs> so I began to see Judaism from the eyes of non-Jews. And it taught me something very interesting. So what is it about being Jewish? That really impresses non-Jews. Well, let me give you a for instance. 20 years ago, I mentioned this before, I was asked by the BBC to do a television documentary on the state of the family in Britain. And I, it was a very, and not the Jewish family, the family in general. And it was an interesting and very challenging assignment. And one of the things I did was I took the person who was then Britain's leading child care expert. Penelope Leach, she wrote all the texts on how to bring up children. Not Jewish, had no Jewish friends. And I took her to a Jewish school. I just wanted to film how a non-Jew reacts when seeing a Jewish school for the first time. So I took her to a Jewish school with the five-year-old kids at junior school on Friday morning. And I imagine in all your schools, we all do the same thing, the little kids do the mock Shabbat. They, they prepare for Shabbat by enacting it. So here was this non-Jewish lady who for the first time was seeing this 
seeing these five-year-old parents and five-year-old grandparents, <laughs> and the five-year-old parents are blessing the five-year-old children and welcoming the five-year-old <laughs> guests, and she's absolutely flabbergasted because she's, there's nothing like this in any non-Jewish school. And she was asking the kids, we were filming her, uh, what do you like about this Sabbath of yours and what don't you like? And this little five-year-old boy said, oh, it's terrible, I can't watch television, it's awful. And she said, what do you like about the Sabbath? And this little five-year-old boy said, you know what I like about the Shabbat? It's the only time in the week when daddy does not have to rush off. And as we were leaving the school, she turned to me and said, Chief Rama, you don't realize this. That Shabbat of yours is saving their parents' marriages. And suddenly I saw a Shabbat from a non-Jewish perspective that I'd never seen before. Very often families split apart because we don't spend time together. But because of Shabbat, we do. We sanctify the family. And if you want a culture shock, here it is. You know, we felt already 12, 13 years ago, we sensed that there was going to be a certain anti-Semitism coming. We, we saw it very far off. And we decided, Elaine and myself, we're going to win as many friends and allies for Israel and the Jewish people as we can. And we know perfectly well that one of the most important friends we can make is India, because Indians like Jews. Their tradition is old as Judaism, and uh, they've never had any anti-Semitism, and they also feel very threatened by radical Islam, by a nuclear Pakistan on their borders and all the rest of it. So we went and spent a week with the Dalai Lama, with the leading Hindus, and with the leading Sikhs in Amritsar in North India, which is the Jerusalem of the Sikhs. They have a gold, the Golden Temple in Amritsar. And there we are, I, I said a few words, the Dalai Lama said a few words, in, in the U Sikh University in Amritsar. And up gets a gentleman called Mahinda Singh, the third most senior Sikh in the world. And in front of 2,000 Sikh students, Indian, he gets up, and I, I was absolutely... Uh, Gobsmacked. What's that in American English? I don't know. <laughs> he gets up and says, you know, to all these 2,000 Sikh students, he says, you know what we need? We need what the Jews have. We need Shabbos. <laughs> he said, you won't believe it. One day a week, they put everything aside. And they spend time with their children, their time with the family, and time with the friends. We need Shabbos. He sat down. I said, Mahinda Singh, you're going to give that sermon in all of our shuls. <laughs> We had, there was an international conference, I don't know if you remember this, five years ago, a global conference in Copenhagen on climate change. For some reason, the government at the time decided it wanted to take not just a political message to Copenhagen, it wanted to take a religious message as well. So the Archbishop of Canterbury and I brought all the faiths together, the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Jain, the Zoroastrian, and the Baha'i, and we all came together to talk religiously about the environment. I said to uh, them, listen, you know, uh, we Jews have a problem. We have a solution to the environmental global warming problem. All you've got to do is keep Shabbos. One day in seven, no cars, no planes, you lower the Earth's carbon footprint by one-seventh end of global warming. The imams came up to me and said, you know, we never thought about that before. We are going to tell everyone not to drive to the mosque on Friday. I said, you can give that sermon in our shoes as well. <laughs> so the idea of Shabbat is one of the most beautiful ideas, and non-Jews really love it. They don't know how to do it, but they love it. And it is fascinating, you know, uh, that... Um, it has this extraordinary power of keeping the family strong. Number two, community, kehila. In 2011, a medical charity in Britain did a survey of, of, uh, of young Brits aged between 18 and 30. And they came up with the following finding, that the average Brit between 18 and 30 has 237 Facebook friends. Does that make sense? 
I, I, I'm technologically challenged, as I try and explain. So I don't know what a Facebook friend is, but uh, I, I, I love Facebook, at least in theory. I've never used it, but <laughs> such a wonderful story. A nice Jewish boy called Mark Zuckerberg has a row with his girlfriend and goes away and invents Facebook. That's such a J Jewish thing to do. Um, <laughs> So they came up with this finding. The average Brit has 237 Facebook friends. When asked on how many of those could you rely, the average answer was two. A quarter said one, an eighth said none. In 2008, a young American couple joined our community in London. Young, newly, young couple with three young children. This is uh, end of July 2008. Why did he join our community? He had just been made European head of Lehman Brothers. One week later, no more Lehman Brothers. This man, three years later, go, going back to the States, stood up in shul and said, I just want to say thank you to every member of this community. We were faced by the biggest crisis in our lives. And you, as a community, came to our rescue and to our help. We could not have survived without you. And I thought to myself, that is the difference between a real friend and a Facebook friend. You are part of the Kehillah, you have real friends. People who, on whom you can rely. People who will help you when you're in a difficult moment. As they know, you will help them if they are in a difficult moment. A community is the place where our joys are doubled and our griefs are halved by sharing them with others. And today, you will not find a source of community anywhere in the world as strong as a Jewish kehillah. And that is the second thing that I think is incredibly important. The third thing is fascinating. We have an atheist in Britain called Richard Dawkins. Have you come across this gentleman? Yeah? He's, he's, he's a, quite an angry atheist. I, I used to call this the intellectual equivalent of road rage. And uh, so the BBC uh, said to me, would I do, I became sort of the BBC's religious person. So they said, would I do a conversation, a debate with Richard Dawkins? I, in fact, I did three of them. So I said to the BBC, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it, but I always like to know, can I be a friend of this person? You know, he's, he's, or, he hates religion and religious leaders hate him. So we invited him round for dinner first. Elaine and I made a little dinner and with, for a few friends. And Richard Dawkins is surrounded by these young Jewish couples of your age. And I don't think he had ever met quite religious people who are quite so thoughtful and intelligent. And it made a big impact on him. And in the course of the dinner, I said, Richard, you believe religion makes you stupid, right? He said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I said, Richard, you're a scientist, right? Absolutely. And you only believe things on the basis of evidence, right? He said, yes. So I said, Richard, what do you do with this piece of evidence? Jews are less than one-fifth of one percent of the population of the world. And they have won 26% of Nobel Prizes in physics, 27% of Nobel Prizes in medicine, 41% of Nobel Prizes in economics, 49% of world chess champions. What do you think? And he stopped, and he thought, and he said, you know what? Jews must be different. <laughs> and ever since then, he's been going around saying this to all his audiences. You know, religion's terrible, but Jews are different. So... <laughs> You know, and I was, I was asked by somebody from, your, from Canadian Broadcasting just now, last week, what do you think it is that makes Jews so extraordinary at, 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 at these, you know, the, the intellectual overachievers of all time? And I told them the story 
of the physicist Isidore uh, Rabi, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics. And he told, some, he told people, my mother made me a scientist. How come? Because when I was five years old, all the kids in my class would go back home and their parents would ask, what did you learn in school today? I went home and my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good kasha today? Did you ask a good question today? To be a Jew is to ask questions. It is not people of little faith who ask questions in Judaism. It's the great heroes and heroines of faith. Avram Avinu says, Hashovet Kalaretz, lo yaseh mishpat, shall the judge of all the earth not do justice. Moshe Rabbeinu says, why have you done evil to this people, God? Jeremiah says, I know, God, every time I have an argument with you, you win, but still I want to ask you, why do the righteous suffer? Why do the wicked, wicked prosper? The whole book of Job is, what was your first memory as a child? Of, of asking, you know, I mean, that's, that's how you begin. You know that uh, in 2005, uh, I was knighted by Her Majesty, actually, which was really lovely. I don't know what the Syri Syrian Jewish equivalent, what, how do you say nachas? <laughs> what you're supposed to give to your parents, yeah? Nachat. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll practice it. I'll get there eventually. Can you imagine this? My mum gets to meet the queen. Forget that, that her son's getting a knighthood. She, she gets to Buckingham Palace to meet the queen. And of course, there's a technical difficulty there because when you are knighted, you have to kneel. And Jews don't bow down to anyone except the Kaddish Baruch Hu. So they had to make a special stand. They actually made this special stand for me to sort of incline a little <laughs> without actually bending down. So that's what I did. And uh, the queen turns to Prince Philip and says, why is this knight different from all other knights? <laughs> So number three, and this I learned from Richard Dawkins, we are the faith that has enough confidence in our faith to encourage our children to ask questions. And that is what makes us intellectually grow. Number four, you know, again, they asked me to do with Richard Dawkins open a science festival for the BBC because they discovered that Jews are the only people who are not threatened by science. Can you imagine this? 2,000 years ago, our sages coined a special bracha to be said in the presence of a great non-Jewish scientist. I say it whenever I meet a Nobel Prize winner. I said it first. I was had the zuchut of getting an honorary doctorate together with James Watson, co-discoverer of DNA. I made the bracha over him. He's a total atheist. I don't think he approved remotely. <laughs> and can you imagine Chazal in the time of the Mishnah? Who were the scientists that they were making their blessing over? They were either Greeks or they were Romans. The Greeks tried to ban in the days of, of Hanukkah, the practice of Judaism, the Romans, the people who destroyed the temple, and yet they had so much respect for the integrity of scientific knowledge that they coined the bracha, and it's an incredible thing. I love this intellectual openness, and you, Sephardim, did it so much better than our Ashkenazim. When Maimonides came to write the, not his philosophy book, the guy for perplexed, when he came to write his book of Jewish law, the Mishneh Torah, in Hilchot Yesodei Torah, chapter 2, Alocha 2, he says it's by learning science that we come to the love and fear of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We regard secular study as a holy quest to see the world as God's work and the human person as God's image. And that intellectual openness is terrific. The next thing, Virtually every other religion in the history of the world has been a culture of acceptance. Why are bad things happening in the world? Because that's the will of God, so you put up with it. Judaism is a culture of protest. When we see bad things happening in the world, we don't say that's the will of God. We say that is what Hashem wants us to put right. And we go out there and we do it. One year ago, and this is the reason I'm mentioning it, a great Jewish lady from New York, whom I only distantly knew, passed away in a very tragically in a riding accident. She died at the age of 52. I met her only once, 
but it was, was, was so typical to me. Her name was Anna Heyman, of blessed memory. I don't know if any of you know the, the name. She was, uh, you know, she was a housewife in Manhattan, and she happened to be watching in 2004 a television program. It was a documentary on the 10th anniversary of the massacre in Rwanda where the Hutus and their associates murdered 800,000 Tutsis in 100 days, mainly by machete. And 10 years on, television had done a documentary about all these orphans who were left. And she says to herself, hang on, I'm Jewish. We're supposed to do something about that. And what did she do? She found a few guys in Israel, Yumin Ord, you know, the youth village in the Galil, and various other people like the late Reuven Feuerstein of blessed memory, who, whose first work was with traumatized orphans of the Holocaust. She got in touch with the joint here, and they built a beautiful Israeli youth village in the middle of Rwanda called the Agahoza Shalom Youth Village. Look it up on YouTube when you get home. You see this little bit of Israel in the middle of Rwanda for 750 Rwandan orphans, teaching them computing skills, leadership skills, how to grow avocados, the kind of thing Israelis do. Because when you're a Jew and you see bad things happening in the world, you don't say, Okay, that's the will of God. You say, Hashem wants me to go out there. Just a week ago, I think, 10 days ago, I did an evening with Dr. Georgette Bennett from here in New York now, who is leading a nice Jewish lady, uh, uh, married to, uh, no longer alive, married to a, a rabbi, who is leading, personally leading, the entire international ref refugee effort dealing with Syrian refugees today. Are you surprised that it is a Jew leading that effort? That's what we do. When we see people suffering, we don't just stand there and watch. We get up and do. And that too makes me proud to be a Jew. And then of course, the way we deal with children. I don't know, do any of you have children? Are you all married? If you aren't, I know a wonderful young person for you. <laughs> There's a big problem today with affluence. If Hashem has blessed you, what do you do so as not to spoil your kids? We have a friend in London whom Hashem has blessed. And I think he's pretty rich. And he was wondering, what do I give my son as a bar mitzvah present. And I just shared this with you. I think it is the most beautiful bar mitzvah present I ever heard of. You know what he did? He went with his son for one week to a Romanian Jewish orphanage. And for a week, they lived with the orphans. And at the end of the week, the son turned to his father and said, Dad, do you think when I grow up, I'll be able to help them the way you help them? You want your kids not to be spoiled by wealth? That's how you bring them up. That is what it is to be a Jewish parent. To know, yes, we have no problem with wealth. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is, what do you do with it? And what do you teach your children to do with it? We had a great Anglo-Jew in the Victorian age who was a Sephardi. Actually, he was the head of the Sephardi community called Sir Moses Montefiore. He made a very, very smart career move. He married a Rothschild. <laughs> this allowed him to retire at the age of 40, and he lived to be 100, which in the 19th century was worth something, I think, the fact that he walked every week from Park Lane to Bevis Marks in the city, that's five miles but both ways. It probably kept him young. And somebody once asked him, Sir Moses, what are you worth? And he thought for a moment and he said, well, 200,000 pounds. This is a long time ago, okay? And the person said to him, Sir Moses, you're worth much more than that. You must be worth millions. 
And Sir Moses Montefiore said, you didn't ask me how much I own. You asked me how much am I worth. So I gave you the figure of how much money I have given this year to tzedakah. Because we are worth what we are willing to share with others. You teach that to your children, and you will have children of whom you can be proud. So that really are some of the things, the way we bring up children, the way we celebrate family, the way we ask questions, the way we address the pains and the injustices and sufferings of this world, and the strength of Jewish communities. Those are just five things among many that should make each of us proud to be a Jew. In the summer of 2002, this is around May, June 2002, the Queen celebrated her golden jubilee. And she made a big, uh, the food wasn't half as good as yours, but it was okay, you know. And she made this big tea, this for Kolma Minushu, all the faiths in, in Britain. There were a lot of people there from every religion. And towards the end, a very, very Haredi Muslim <laughs> came up to me and said, are you the chief rabbi? I said, yes. He said, my wife wants a word with you. Now, I want you, some of you, to, some of you may remember what was happening around May, June 2002. I don't know if the word Janine means anything to you. This was a very fraught moment. And relations between Jews and the Muslim community were at an all-time low. So as his wife came up to me, covered in a big hijab, I thought, what is she going to do? She's going to hunt me a China about Israel. What is she going to say? And this is what she said. She said, Chief Ramai, I just want to thank you for your book, A Letter in the Scroll. Now, if any of you know this book, this is a book of Jewish pride. It says nothing about Islam. It says nothing that could possibly be meaningful. And I suddenly realized that when we stand up for our faith, we bring blessing to people of all faiths. Because, believe it or not, people look to us. We were the first. Christianity is, we are twice as old as Christianity, three times as old as Islam. We were the first. We went through the fire and we survived. And to, to hear from a committed Muslim that she felt empowered and inspired by the way I spoke about being a Jew, I found that very moving. Actually, on one occasion, we had a group called the City Circle in London, high-flying Muslims in the city of London, all in, uh, in, in uh, investment and banking. And they actually invited me. They said, uh, could you stop being chief rabbi and become chief imam? I said, I've got enough Taurus already. <laughs> so there it is. I came after 22 years of going out to the non-Jewish public. I discovered this. Non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. Non-Jews are embarrassed by Jews who are embarrassed by Judaism. So if we walk tall, we bring blessing not only to ourselves, but to the world. I am with a little story. Because, you know, although I said it never quite gets as cold in New York as in London, we can do miserable better than you can. And it was one of those really, really miserable winters. This is 25, 30 years ago. And I said to Elaine, for the first time in our lives, let's go and cheer ourselves up with some winter sun. We'd never done this before. So we thought we'll go to Elat. Have any of you been to Elat? I, I want you to imagine Elat 30 years ago. It's a, developed a lot since. But 30 years ago, it was just a little few hotels in the middle of a wilderness. We told a few friends that we were going to Elat. They said, Rabbi Sachs, I wasn't yet chief rabbi. Rabbi Sachs, don't go to Elat. We said, why? They said, it's not Rabonish. The dress of people on the beach is not necessarily up to full rabbinical standards of modesty. We ignored the advice, and you know what? They were right. 
I spent the entire week without my glasses, bumping into it. I said to Elaine, let's look for something that's vaguely robotic, that's, you know, that's not embarrassing. Well, what can we do that's not embarrassing? And I don't know whether they still have it today, but 30 years ago in LA, they used to have glass bottom boats. You could go out and look at the lovely fish. So we went on this glass bottom boat. We were the only passengers on the boat. The captain of the boat heard us speaking English, and he came up to us with great excitement. He said, I tell me, Anglia, are you from England? We said, yeah, why do you ask? He said, because I've just been to England for a holiday. We said, how did you like it? He said, oh, wonderful, he said. The buildings, so old. The grass, so green. The people, so polite. And then he looked around him at this brown, barren desert landscape. And with an enormous smile, he said, Avalze Shalano. But this is ours. Friends, there are many civilizations, there are many cultures and religions in the world. And surely they have done great things. Avalze Shalano. But this is ours. Live your Judaism, love your Judaism and be a blessing to the world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rabbi. In your packets is an index card and hopefully a pen. If you have a question, please note it on the index card and pass it down the aisle. We'll begin the questioning now. Thank you, Rabbi. You spoke ever so eloquently about the beauty of being a Jew in the modern world, but we have a few questions about the challenges of being a Jew in the modern world. Um, we'll start with the first from the crowd. Um, it's a very simple, basic question. How important is faith in a personal God to Judaism? And I would just follow that up with, is there any value in living an observant life without that faith? <clears throat> How important is faith? First of all, I think faith is incredibly important. Can you, can you hear me? Is the amplification okay? I mentioned my late father, Allah Shalom. You know, lived a difficult life. Um, Oh, no, I didn't. I mentioned him before. Lived a difficult life, came over as a refugee from Poland and so on. He never learned very much. He never knew very much about Yadut. But he had great faith. And I saw him go through five operations in his 80s. And each one sapped his strength a little more. And here was a Jew who didn't know much, who never studied in yeshiva, left school at 14. But he would always just take with him to hospital his talit, his tefillin, his sidur, his chumash, and his sefer tehillin. And I saw my late father, Allah Shalom, sit and say tehillin. And I saw him grow stronger as he was saying these songs. And I thought to myself, you know, Dad, you left school at 14. I, I was educated at Oxford and Cambridge University. I wish I had the strength of faith that you had. So the truth is, I saw how faith carried him through life with, you know, with a, a sense of pride and a sense of, you know, somehow or other, whatever is happening, I am in Hashem's hands. And I found that very moving. I didn't come to my faith through uh, study, through formal study of Jewish philosophy. I came to it by seeing the difference it made in his life. However, I will tell you something very, very fundamental. It's fundamental. That what is really interesting is li in life is not our faith in God. What is really interesting is God's faith in us. Just work this out. He knew what we were going to be like, and he still created us. He knew what Jews were like, and he still chose us. We say in Psalm 27, which presumably you also say during Elul and Tishri, Le David Hashem or Ivi Yishi, 
היא אבי ואימי עזבוני והשם יאספני. Maybe my parents would reject me, but God never rejects me. And I tell you, there were moments of difficulty in my life when I simply said, you know what, I feel terrible about myself, but Hashem believed in me. Can I let him down? And it is that faith that has made all the difference to my life. What, just as a follow-up, what would you say words of advice would you have for those who perhaps are, have doubts? Well, if you have doubts, you're a good Jew. <laughs> we are the people whose name, Yisrael, means Kisarita im Elohim v'im anashim v'atuchal. You are the people who wrestle with God and with man and you prevail. For 4,000 years, we have been wrestling with God. And He has been wrestling with us. For 4,000 years, we've been wrestling with the world. And they have been wrestling with us. And we never, ever gave up. And we never, ever accepted defeat. Doubt is part of the very essence of Jewish faith. You read chapters 3 and 4 of Sefer Shemot. God says to Moses, go and lead the people Moses says, who am I? They won't believe me. I'm not a man of words. Send somebody else. You know, he doubts himself. The whole book of Job is the most powerful doubt ever about the justice of this world. For 38 chapters, Job hurls questions at heaven. You don't die of doubt. Doubt comes from an active engagement and a wrestling and so on. But I will have to be very honest with you. People sometimes ask me this. Did I ever have a crisis of faith? And my answer categorically is yes. I stood in Auschwitz and I had a crisis of faith. But I have never for one second, I'm being very candid with you, had a crisis of doubt in God. Not once in my whole life. But I have had a crisis of faith in humanity. The Holocaust took place in the epicenter of civilized, enlightened, emancipated Europe. They were playing string quartets in Auschwitz-Birkenau as one and a quarter million human beings, among them a quarter of a million children, were gassed, burned, and turned to ash. After Auschwitz, I don't know how anyone can have faith in human beings. You need faith in God. And that faith in God is what we need to have the courage and the hope to build a better world. So I did have my crisis of faith, but it wasn't in God. Thank you, Rabbi. What significance do you place on ritual practice? someone that would have faith, but the rituals is not as meaningful to them as to their family. Uh, I, do you have in the Syrian Jewish community, probably not, what we have in British Jewry, non-observant Orthodox. Do you know this kind of thing? Yeah. The people who don't come to shul very often, they come on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Here's a true story. True story. It comes from Cape Town in South Africa. There's a shul called Claremont. In, South, in Cape Town, where they bring in the African workers after Yom Kippur to build the sukkah. And they were, these workers were building the shul sukkah, and they want to know, what are we building? So they asked the local expert on Judaism, who is, of course, the shul caretaker, who always knows more about Judaism than, than anyone else. And the caretaker, this non-Jew, explains to them what is Sukkot and what is a Sukkah. And the builders turn to him and say, you mean uh, we're building this for eight days a year? And the caretaker turns around and points at the synagogue and he says, that's nothing, they built that for three days a year. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a story. I was really out of practice. I wasn't getting any exercise. You know, I was living a very heavy lifestyle. 
So I decided one day, and I'm really going to put in a, some intense exercise. So for three days, I ran, uh, I jogged around uh, St. John's Wood and this, that, and the other. And uh, I put in the exercise for a year in three days. You know what happened to me? I landed up in the Wellington Hospital where they have a special clinic for the people who uh, are suffering from trying to keep fit. It's the most dangerous thing you can do, you know, the knee injuries and the goodness knows what. So I got out of Hinshul a year later and I said, you know what, I tried to get all the exercise for a year into three days and I ended up with damaged knees and I did myself a great deal of harm. Friends, don't do the same for spiritual exercise. Don't do a whole year's exercise in three days. You know what it is to keep fit? Do a little every day. And what applies to the body applies to the soul. You need rituals. Every day, you've got to renew your contact with the things that matter. And do a little every day. Because if you give up the rituals, what will happen to your soul is what will happen to your body if you don't take it. Any exercise. End of subject. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to some more general matters. Um, our community, much like the larger Jewish community, I guess the political world, has experienced um, an increasing polarization in, from the so-called left and the so-called right. What, can, what, in your experience, causes that polarization, and what can we do to reverse that? <clears throat> Look, what, what has happened is as follows. Uh, did you ever, do, do you have things called seesaws? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So you remember as a child, you know, there's a child that end of the seesaw and there's a child that end, and you're in balance. But what happens if you've got an adult? How do you create the balance? Anyone know? Have you seen this? What? You've got a... Move the adult inward bit to maintain a balance. So there was a time when the seesaw, which is our relationship with the wider secular culture, was in balance. All of a sudden, the wider culture moved radically to the left. And it happened around the 1960s. Um, I was there. Elaine was there. Um, there was an English... You know, it, it happened around 1963. All of a sudden, Western civilization gave up with astonishing rapidity what came to be known as the Judeo-Christian ethic. So all sorts of things in terms of sexuality and this, that, and the other, and abortion, and goodness knows what. All of that disappeared, and very fast and right throughout the Western world. So the whole of secular society moved in that direction which meant that we had to move in the opposite direction to create that balance. And that's why a number of many Jews became more right-wing, because they wanted to maintain that balance. And because society was no longer in balance with Judaism, they had to move a little further away from society. Whereas the other ones who were essentially gaining their general attitudes from the wider society moved left just because the rest of society moved left. And that is what fragmented the Jewish public uh, beginning in a, around the 1960s. And I remember it very well because I was, I was a, an undergraduate student in those days and we, we could see it happening. Um, I saw a group of Hasidim turn up. I'd never met a Hasid before. And they were turning up at the place where we had our summer holidays. All of a sudden I could see that if you were going to stay orthodox, you probably had to have a, a long black coat and a long black beard. And I remember, as an 18-year-old, asking myself the following question. Is this the beginning of the end of the middle of the road? Are you with me? And I think it probably was the beginning of the end of the middle of the road. So you have people who are going with society far to the left, and you have people distancing themselves from society, we're going far to the right. So there's only one solution. We all have to become Sephardim. 
Because you're the only people who have maintained some kind of reasonable balance here. And uh, I salute you for it, because it was Moses Maimonides, who in an age that was not very sympathetic to Jews, managed to maintain that balance. And somehow, he conferred it on successive generations of Sephardim. But don't go the way of the rest of the Jewish world, because it's pretty bad news. Um, People going to the right, they're great. They're very holy. I'm not always sure if God is holy enough for them, but they are very <laughs> holy. <clears throat> but the trouble is they cut themselves off from the rest of us. So they have lots of Torah, and they have lots of mitzvahs, but they don't share it with the rest of us. And the Jewish people is a people we're supposed to hold together. And the people who've moved to the left are people whom we are losing. And that's a terrible shame. It really is, because those guys who are moving to the left have got wonderful virtues and have, you know, neshamot, they really do, and yet somehow we're not connecting with them. So other than our, my converting the entire Jewish world to become Sephardim, which I would do if I possibly could, if you know of any magical recipe that does it, I would gladly acquire it and use it. But in the meantime, stay where you are, and never lose your hand shake and your embrace of both the left and the right, because they're also Jews, they are also part of the family, and we have to stay together as a family. Other, Rabbi, other than the polarization of people to the right and the left, which we just spoke about, one of the most outwardly evolving roles we are witnessing in modern times is that of women. Do you feel that the Torah clearly delineates between the nature of men and women? And if so, how can they be translated into their respective roles today? Do I believe that there are fundamental differences in the Torah between men and women? Um, you have a very brilliant neuroscientist in America, in Harvard, called Steven Pinker. Do you know Steven Pinker? Does that name mean anything to you? He's one of the most brilliant guys ever. He's a complete atheist. Um, I call him the thinking man's Richard Dawkins, but not. Um, and I love this man. He's a total atheist. He was in my house, and I said, Richard, does an atheist need a sitter? And he said, why not? So uh, he has one of my sidurim. I'm not actually sure what he does with it. <laughs> but I'm uh, tempted to suspect that he's like the Nobel Prize winning physicist Niels Bohr, the, you know, the leader in quantum theory. It is told about Niels Bohr that he was visited by a fellow scientist and he had a horseshoe over his front door. Um, and the fellow scientist saw this and said, Niels, um, you can't believe in that, can you? And Niels Bohr said, of course I don't believe in it. But the thing about it is, it works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> so maybe tefillah works whether you believe it in or not. But I was doing a public conversation with Steven Pinker. And I was saying, you know, I, you know yeah, I think we need to move much more uh, towards equality of men and women. And he told me, you know, on this, Chief Rabbi, you're wrong. Because actually there are fundamental cognitive differences between men and women. And he says that in his book, The Blank Slate. And it's a very, very significant thing that I was corrected on this by an atheist who turned out to be far frommer than I was on this subject. Uh, of course, Larry Summers then repeated it, and they threw him out as president of Harvard. But that's another matter. That's a long story. Um, but, so Stephen says this, and I don't know how true it is or it isn't, but there are biological and cognitive and psychological differences between men and women. And the more neuroscientists study this, the more it is clear that, for instance, there's a non-Jewish lady called Sarah Churchill, and also not a believer, who uh, has a, a very good book called Brain Tr Brain's Trust, where she says the whole of human morality is built on the model of maternal bonding. The, the care that mothers have for children is actually the one thing that 
redeems humanity from, from, from brutality. So I think there are different roles. And uh, I'm picking this up from the atheists, from the neuroscientists, from the behavioral scientists, and from many, many others. Um, and I think the wisdom of the Torah is that it recognizes this. But there is something that has happened. It happened in the 20th century. And people often think that our faith is a very conservative, small c faith. We don't change fast. But something happened in the 20th century which was unprecedented. Women became better, at least as well, Jewishly educated as men. And they became great teachers of Torah. And what is fascinating, I mean, like the late Nechama Leibovitz, and I have the privilege of knowing, Lahavdil ben Chaim Lachaim of Viva Zornberg, who was a student at Cambridge when I first came up, and we learned Torah together, and Erica Brown, who was one of my students, now teaching Torah in Washington. This never happened before. There were never day schools for girls. There were never seminaries for women. And what is really fascinating is who endorsed this? And oddly enough, it was not modern Orthodox Jews. The people who endorsed this in Europe were the Gero Rebbe and the Chofetz Chaim. And here in the United States were the Lubavitcher Rebbe and Rav Soloveitchik said so. So it was these Gedolim who said, yes, something fundamentally has changed in society. And women must now be at least as well educated in Torah as men, and they must become teachers of Torah. It never happened before. It has happened in our time. And I find it enormously privileging to have witnessed this emergence of the women's voice in Torah. There are two voices of Torah. If you read Tanakh, Malachi speaks about Siftei Kohen, the, 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 the lips of the priest. And it says, Torah emet al the law of truth was on his tongue. Whereas the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, that we say every Friday night, Eishet Chayel says, Torah Chesed, Alushona, the law of loving kindness is on her tongue. So we have from men the law of truth. But what we now have from the women is the law of kindness. And that means teaching Torah in a way, in a women, woman's voice, that never happened before, at least since Deborah, the prophetess. So we are witnesses to a major change. And I'm enthralled that it was led by the Gedolei Hador, the great sages of the generation. Um, slightly changed topic. You've written much about coexistence, um, one or at least one or two books on it. This question, again, comes from the crowd. How do you think we can create or foster a culture of tolerance in our community. In our community? In our community. Okay. You mean among Jews? Yes. You mean we should tolerate one another? <laughs> Forget it. Totally impossible. <laughs> um, look, let me tell you this. We are the only people in history, all of whose canonical texts are anthologies of argument. Abraham and Moses argue with God. You read the Mishnah, Rabbi X says this, Rabbi Y says that. You read the Midrash, Shivim Panin La Torah, there's 70 different interpretations. Along comes the Gemara and looks at the arguments of the Mishnah, and instead of saying Rabbi X is right or Rabbi Y is right, they deepen the argument, they have a bigger argument. Do you know why God chose the Jewish people? Because he loves a good argument. So here we are, the people who first learnt that you can have a multiplicity of voices. You can have fundamental arguments. And those things keep you together instead of splitting you apart. Now, we are the only people who did this. How come we lost it? How come the various factions no longer talk to one another? How come that the Today, people judge your piety by how many people you refuse to eat with. <laughs> it's crazy. This is not Jewish. 
We are the people who were chosen as a people. Tzibur, the Hebrew word for community, means tzadikim, benonim, v'urashayim, the righteous, the intermediate, and the guy who's sitting next to you we don't talk about. You know, that's who God chose, the sum total of the Jewish people. We are one family. You get the best arguments within the family, the best rows within the family. Why? Because if you have a row with your friend, your friend is no longer your friend. But you have a row with a member of your family, and tomorrow they're still a member of your family. So we can have good arguments and good disagreements because we know we're not going to walk away. We are still family. So despite all the differences, despite all the arguments, and we are enriched by those differences, still we have to hold together as a family. And I really believe this, and that's why on television and in public, I do conversations with Jewish atheists and with Jewish people who hate rabbis and all that kind of stuff, just to show the world this is who we are. I remember doing a conversation with the most uh, famous secularist in Israel, the novelist Amos Oz. We did a public conversation because I was worried about the rifts in Israeli society. And this was Amos Oz's opening sentence. He said, I don't think I'm going to agree with Rabbi Sachs on everything, but then on most things I don't agree with myself. <laughs> so, you know, we can disagree and stay one family. And that, I think, we lose at our peril. Never, ever give support to that tendency. We have to hold together as one family. Rabbi, you mentioned... <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you believe non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. To what extent, if any, do you think people should hide their Jewishness today in an increasingly anti-Semitic world? Let me tell you something. You won't remember this, and in, in any case, it never really applied in America, because in America, you have 20 times as many Jews as we have in Britain. So in Britain, Jews, until 1967, until after the Six-Day War, never wore a yarmulke in public. Even rabbis didn't wear a yarmulke in public. It was an extraordinary thing. They kept one in Israel they called profil namuch, I don't, do we have any philosophers in the house? Oh, you, sorry. You'll get this. Nobody else will. You, you had a Jewish philosophy professor at Columbia University who said Jewish identity is incognito ergo sum. Sorry, you have to have a PhD to understand that, but it was, it was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> so here I am in England where nobody wears a yarmulke in the, in the early 60s, and I'm coming out of shul, and I'm wearing my yarmulke, and a very, very well-intentioned guy comes up to my father and says, Mr. Sachs, I, I think your son has forgotten to take his yarmulke off. And my father, I repeat, he was a simple Jew, but my goodness, he was a proud Jew, turned around and said, no child of mine will ever be ashamed to wear his Jewish identity in public. And that was a critical moment for me in my life. So I, I know it happened in France, you know, and I respect that. I mean, it happened many, already eight or nine years ago, where a chief rabbi of France told people, don't wear a yarmulke in public. I would never do that. And as a matter of principle, from the moment that's what my father said, I knew that's it. If they will not accept us when we're wearing a yarmulke, they won't accept us without a yarmulke. So why should we hide our identity? The truth is, um, we wear ide our identity with pride, and this will not, I repeat, not increase anti-Semitism. On the contrary, it will reduce anti-Semitism. And let me tell you a story. Have we got time for a story? One last story. One last story. Here it is. <laughs> Moscow, 1989. You remember, for, for 70 years, Jews were unable to practice Judaism in public. Along comes Mikhail Gorbachev and opens up 
the, the Soviet Union, Perestroika, Glasnost. In 1991, I had the zuchut in uh, the mansion house where the Lord Mayor of London lives of lighting Hanukkah candles with Mikhail Gorbachev. After he'd lit Hanukkah candles through an interpreter, because he couldn't speak English, he asked the interpreter to ask me what he's just done. <laughs> so I said, would you please tell the president the following? Over 2,000 years ago, our people lost their religious freedom. And they fought, and they won, and they recovered their religious freedom. 70 years ago, in Russia, our people lost their religious freedom. Today, thanks to you, Mr. President, they've recovered it. You are part of the story, and you are part of our celebrations. The interpreter translated this into Russian, and Mikhail Gorbachev actually blushed. I don't think he was used to people saying nice things, did he? <laughs> what, you will, what you will not know is that, sadly, it had a downside. Because just as Jews were able to be Jewish in a way they hadn't been in the past, so anti-Semites were able to be openly anti-Semitic in a way they hadn't been in the past. And so there was a rise in those years of anti-Semitism. A very, very from rabbi from uh, the holy city of Manchester uh, went out in those days to help strengthen Jewish life in Russia. You know, he was a very from guy with a long kapota and a shrimal and a long beard. And uh, one day, a young Jewish woman came to him in great distress. She said, all these years, I never spoke about my Jewishness, and nobody ever else spoke about the fact that I was Jewish. But today, when I walk in the street, people shout at me, Jid, Jid, Jew, Jew. What shall I do? And the rabbi looked at her, him and said, you know, he said, look at me, the way I'm dressed. Probably they don't think I'm an Episcopalian. <laughs> and yet, in all these months I've been here, no one has shouted at me, Jid, Jid. Why do you think that is? And the young woman thought for a moment, and she said something that I find astounding but true. She said, they know if they shout Jew at me, I will take that as an insult. If they shout Jew at you, you will take that as a compliment. So if we want to fight anti-Semitism, the way to fight it is walk tall as Jews. And sometimes miracles happen. Do I have time for one really last yeah. story? Sometimes miracles happen. I'll tell you some, a little story which I find extraordinary. Uh, the place in the east end of London, like the Lower East Side, where all Jews were, today is all Muslims, all of them, from Bangladesh. The shul, the Mahsiki Adas, where Rav Kukzetzal was the Rav in the First World War, is today a mosque. And a Jewish couple made a little museum of immigration in the East End of London so that these Muslim immigrants to Britain should see the Irish story and the Jewish story and connect with Irish and with Jews. And I went to this place and I saw a video they'd taken of the local school. And the, the, they'd taken the six and seven year old Muslim children to this museum of immigration, which they loved. And uh, the kids then learnt a little a little drama, a little act. And I saw the video of it. And I'm going to tell you the little story they told. And you have to bear in mind that this is a story being told by six- and seven-year-old Muslim children from Bangladesh. I, I still find it hard to believe it happened, but it happened. These little kids tell the following story. A Jew one day came to a little village in Russia where no Jews had ever been because the people are so anti-Semitic. But this Jew goes anyway, and as he comes in with his horse and cart and his goods to trade with, the whole town come out and shout at him, Jew, Jew, Jew! And to their amazement, instead of being horrified or turning and leaving, he has a huge smile on his face. And he gets down from the cart, and he says, 
thank you for the most beautiful welcome. I've never had a more beautiful welcome than that. And he takes out his little bag of money and he gives everyone five gold rubles. Thank you for making me feel so at home. Well, they're a little bit puzzled, but five rubles is five rubles, so they go away. The next morning, enthralled to see what's going to happen, they surround his house, and they're shouting, Jew, Jew! And again, he comes out with a big smile on his face, and he says, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have so much money, but please take one gold ruble each. Well, a gold ruble, better than nothing. They take one ruble and go away. Third day comes. They surround his house, and again, they're all shouting, Jew, Jew, Jew! And the third time, the Jew comes out with a big smile on his face and says, thank you, thank you for the welcome. Unfortunately, I've got almost no money left. I can give you 10 kopecks but that is each, but that's all I've got. And they look at him and they say, for a lousy 10 kopecks, you expect us to shout Jew, Jew? And they never shouted Jew again. <laughs> So if young Muslim children can learn that truth, so can the world, and let there be shalom al Israel and peace in the world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you, Rabbi. Pearls of wisdom. And a little entertainment. Not. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. I, uh, I want to just say that... Uh, an evening like tonight, I reflect back the years, how many years, Morris, six years or so, watching you in action, seeing our vision come to reality. Just a night like tonight makes all the work that we've done for the last six years so much worthwhile. So uh, special thanks to Jaime and his committee for an unbelievable job. When did you figure out I was the closer? I'd like to close out the evening by first thanking the lecture event committee. They've done a superb job on organizing every aspect of tonight that was flawless. Jackie Dweck, Louis Jerome, Joseph Maller, Joseph Towell, and A.B. Herreri. Uh, special thanks to Murray Mala, our committee chairman, doing an excellent job. Please come up, Murray. <laughs> Murray, we'd like to present you with a gift for the wonderful job you've done. Thank you. Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, what an honor, what a pleasure. You have a remarkable way of taking such deep concepts, deep philosophies, deep Jewish thought, and simplifying it to a, to a, in lay terms that makes it easy for us to understand. We really appreciate every word, every bit of wisdom, and uh, we hope we'll have the merit and zikhut to hear you again. Thank you so much. <laughs> Rabbi, we'd had, we had to find something that was Fardic and Ashkenaz, so we, we looked hard. We'd like to present you with the beautiful Megillah, and an inscription which I'd like to read, which is presented by Sephardic Community Alliance. It says, uh, A beautiful pasuk from our Megillah. Our, as you know, our rabbis say, Ora zu Torah. And as a representative of Torah to the Jewish world globally, we'd like to present you with this Megillah. Okay, 
We know what stands behind every great man, so we'd like to ask uh, Lady Elaine to please come up. I'd like to present you. <laughs> now, now, we didn't ask uh, for the rabbi's approval on this, but he did mention that he, he heard the food that we have is not so bad, so <laughs> we'd like to present you with the... Uh, Aromas of Aleppo. It's also a healthy uh, cookbook, so I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jaime? Eli, Eli, thank you so much. Uh, he was sitting next to me, I elbowed him, and I asked him, could you please do these closing remarks? And was off the cuff, thank you very much. Rabbi, once again, we're, we're so delighted to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're delighted to have you. In your packet, there's a questionnaire. We're open to your suggestions. We want to hear what you would like to hear. Please communicate with us. Please get involved. We need your involvement. The SEA operates entirely on funds raised from our community. We need your involvement. We also need your donations. So if you have the opportunity to support the Sephardic Community Alliance, please do so. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you all for coming.